Welcome to episode 69 of the Rex Chapman Show with my super dope homeboy from the Lex Town, Josh Hopkins. What's up, Josh? It's episode 69. 69. <laughs> so it doesn't mean anything. Um, stupid. Um, what's up? What episode? What's what episode is it, Josh? It's episode. It's episode 69. <laughs> 69 it's stupid yeah. it doesn't matter um uh, well anyway hey you, have you read any anything this week famous 69s and famous 69s famous 69 uh yes one that i know of and that's uh mark stank schlereth stank 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 yeah stank that's yeah, a good one i, I uh, uh also from the nfl jared allen Jared Allen. He's been there. He, he was 69. He was I, I wonder, is that one that they wanted? Like, or was that like the last number available? Mm, I said they're probably grown ups and didn't even really think about it. I no way. Zero chance. Agree to disagree. Anyway, how's Austin, buddy? It's great. It is great. Uh Getting uh, close to um, the holidays. It's nice yes, here. It is. I'm gonna I'm gonna head home to Kentucky for the holidays. What about you, Rex? I'm gonna head home and meet you there for a few days. How about that? Oh yeah. Maybe we can do one of these side by side. That would be nice. That would be really would be nice. nice. You uh, you brought nice. it up, but uh, have you have you uh, we'll get into our book club? Yeah. What uh, what'd yeah. you read? What'd you read this week, Rex? Nothing. Oh, nothing. Okay. Yeah. Well, what about you? Did you read anything? I, I didn't. I didn't read anything. That's been book club. Yeah. Um, Josh, I'm very excited about the guest we have today, and I want to get right to it. I've, we've been working on this for a month, and something came up every time, and most of the time it was my fault. Uh, but we put this off and put it off. Someone who really and truly is one of the first names that I think of my earliest basketball memories. I don't remember him playing. I remember, I I do remember him running up and down the court, big Afro at the time. But I remember my mom just talking about, Oh, that Lynn Elmore, that Lynn Elmore. (laughs) So let's get right to it. Let's get to episode 69 with former 10 year ABA NBA veteran college basketball analyst, attorney, senior lecturer for Columbia university University of Maryland Hall of Famer and still the leading rebounder in Maryland Terrapin history. Welcome, Leonard J. Elmore. Welcome, Lynn. Hey, thanks, man. Nice to be with you guys. What's the J for? Joseph. Joseph. Okay. We always try to find it. And if, you know, just something we do, but okay, Joseph. Yeah, my nickname was Joey when I was a kid. You know, you're one of my earliest uh basketball like you're one of the earliest names that i associate with basketball i would have been yeah uh, like my dad played in the old aba i think right before you got there and so you know as i i grew up i was born in 67 so you know as i'm six seven eight years old my dad, of course, I'm listening to my dad watch games and listen to games, and he's talking to me about, you know, Lou Alcindor and Lynn Elmore and all these guys that, and, and to this day, those are the, you know, they're the, they're my earliest basketball memories. I just wanted to let you know that. I don't know if I've ever told you that. I appreciate that. I don't know. Your memory might be faulty because there's no way he mentioned me in the same sentence. <laughs> Well, but that's a whole other story we did go to the same high school i know that i know yeah, that. i want to get into some years, of that he was older than me but anyway what was that we just like, recently though? had we just recently had the still i think he's still the uh the most points scored in a season we had walt williams from maryland and now we got the leading rebounder from maryland that's right that's, we, we're covering our our terps our terp bases uh, bases here with their the records. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Hey, Lynn, uh, you were born in Brooklyn. Grew up during the height of civil rights movement. You know what was taught to you from your parents at, at an early age that made you engage in that way. 
Um, it wasn't anything specific. It was, you know, their actions, behavior, that of some of my relatives. Um, I had an aunt who was truly, um, really versed in geopolitics, you know, not just civil rights in the United States, but she used to talk about the CIA plundering the Congo and killing Patrice Lumumba and some of the other things that would go on. And, you know, and we obviously listened, uh, but, you know, getting on the bus and going to the March on Washington, uh, you know, watching on television uh, the demonstrations. And the one that stuck with me was on a Sunday night watching uh, the fire hoses turned on people in Birmingham. Um, you know, those are the things that, uh, you know, that I recall vividly. Uh, it was interesting because where we lived in Brooklyn and then moved to Queens, really hadn't had any uh, abject um, face up with racism per se. Now, I'm sure there were subtle things that I probably didn't recognize, but in New York City, it was a little bit different. But you know that's uh you know that's how we we grew up uh, we grew up in the church as well and you know the idea of self respect the idea of you know the combination of Martin Luther King uh, but also a, a little bit of Malcolm you know you you have self respect um, you know peace nonviolence but don't mess with me you know that so, was <laughs> that was the uh, the mantra so to speak I I guess my immediate question is how was your aunt your aunt so well versed in geopolitics. Uh, she was a reader. Um, my aunt, uh, the long story. My mother and her family were from Louisiana, small town. And uh, you know, my mother was a salutatorian in her high school. She got a scholarship to uh, to HBCU, Southern University, but she couldn't accept it because her family was so poor as sharecroppers. Wow. Uh, she succeeded my aunt who had gone up to New York first to try to you know make a living and she went up there they both were, were very well read and um you know it was that type of thing where education was so important and, and so my aunt as I said continued to read was always uh speaking about politics itself and you know it was just a kind of a habit in the house wow Wow. Um, yeah. So you grew up with the uh, I guess. You weren't always, you know, six, nine. Um, you grew up. You had a obviously you had a, a passion for education. Did you have did you have a, a more of a passion for basketball or how did that how did you weigh those things as you grew up and especially as you became a better and better player? Well, first of all, guys, um, basketball, I didn't, I didn't start playing basketball until I was about 14. I was, a, I was a baseball player. And, you know, where we grew up first in Brooklyn and then moving to Queens, baseball was all I knew. I mean, I remember in we lived in the housing projects, but in the housing projects, it wasn't what you thought of today. It was uh, uh, very integrated. Uh, in my neighborhood, you're black, you're Jewish, or you know, sprinkled in folks from Italian descent. And you know, all we did was play baseball. I went to an yeah. elementary school that was, uh, you know, highly thought of. I was one of the few uh, black kids that was in the school. And so, you know, that was a little bit different than, uh, again, some of the more segregated schools. We had more resources and that was in classes that were, you know, kind of advanced. When we moved to Queens, uh, when both my parents got city jobs and could afford their own homes, our own home, um, we were in a predominantly black neighborhood, a black neighborhood of strivers, people who were, you know, blue collar workers um, and everybody worked for the city. Or the, or the federal government. You were either a postman, a garbage man, a policeman, or a fireman. That, that was your best, everybody, very wow. few lawyers, et cetera. And uh, it was there that, you know, I started to look on, look on basketball as something because I watched guys playing, but I was still playing baseball. And, and I got discovered in my junior high school. Uh, I was playing. You guys ever watch uh, Cuckoo's Nest? Yeah, of One course. flew over to Cuckoo's Nest. Remember Chief? Yeah, yeah. That, that, we played half court and that's kind of who I looked like 
<laughs> put it in the basket, what? Chief. Put it in. Put it in, Chief. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and so, so my PE teacher saw that and, and saw me. Obviously, I was growing a little head and shoulders above uh, my my classmates. He asked. He said, uh, "Don't you want to play a sport with people your size? Playing playing on my insecurities." And I said, "Sure, why not?" So he he takes me down one day to this high school in Manhattan, and we're out there on the court, a uh, bunch of guys warming up and stuff. And he says, "Okay, you know, let's see what you can do." So center jump, they throw the ball up, we tip it. I'm still standing at center court, and I'm saying, "How do you guys know which way to run?" Because I didn't know the rules. <laughs> wow. You know, wow. I watched I watched it on TV. You know, I knew a little bit of this and that, but you know, it wasn't until then that I started. But I had athletic ability, and um, you know, the next year I wound up going to power and translated a little bit. I went to the rucker. The rucker taught me, you know, self respect on the court. Taught me not to back down. Taught me not to be embarrassed. And I go from, um, you know, playing like chief to being all city the next year and following me as all American. So is that who is that? Is that me? I'm here in Brooklyn. No, that, that? I, I'm in New York. <laughs> I, I'm so, in Brooklyn, uh, so it might I, be I, me too. <laughs> I, I, I see, and I see the bridge through your window, man. I, yeah. yeah. I used to I used to work in that looks in the real. DA's office. <laughs> <laughs> I know that. I know that. Has there ever been a, a better high school basketball program than Power Memorial? You Mario Ely, uh, Kareem. Yeah. Well, pretty, you know, Jason strong. Williams. Jason That's Williams right. who was there. And Chris Mullen. Chris uh, transferred out. One of my uh, high school teammates was the coach, and Chris transferred out with his variant afterwards. But, you know, it's, it had pretty doggone good reputation. And also, Dick Bavetta. Remember? Is that right? I didn't yeah. know that. I yeah. didn't know that. Um, I, I know I'm, I'm going to let you ask a question here in a second, Josh, but I've got, I got one, one other thing I want to ask. So at 14, you, you stumble across basketball. You obviously progressed extremely fast to where, you know, you guys have the number one pro or one number one team in the country, your senior year. And then you go on to, I mean, you go to Maryland. <laughs> I mean, Going from not playing to the University of Maryland is an amazing feat in and of itself. But then my question to you would be, what was that like for you socially when you got to Maryland from um, New York? Interesting, because one of the reasons I chose Maryland was because it was, you know, situated close enough to New York where I figured I could get home. Um, had an idyllic campus. Mm -hmm. which is a campus that's even more beautiful now than it was when, when I was. Uh, that building uh, is amazing. Yeah, uh, it's, yeah. It, it's amazing, you know, but it's not a cold field house. No, no, right, no right. <laughs> it doesn't have the same, doesn't have the same ambiance. But yeah, that's right. Um, but but the other thing was there are a lot of uh, East Coast folks, New York, New Jersey. And, and so I kind of felt at home. Um, certainly had a lot of commuters who are from Maryland. Historically, though, I was almost shocked as you spend more time to realize that, you know, only five years earlier, I got to Maryland in 70, only five years earlier were the lunch counters on Route 1 integrated. You know, wow. only several, seven to eight years earlier did um, they have full integration uh, of the uh, of the campus. Now, prior to that, yeah, there were a few uh, students of color that, that went there, but, you know, full integration where, you know, regularly you could attend, you know, had only happened five, eight, you know, 10 years earlier than that. Uh, wow. But again, having, having the East Coast influence, uh, a lot of New Yorkers there, you know, made you feel at home. And, you know, basketball became, you know, the culture uh, to a great extent on the campus. And, you know, people really gravitated towards us um, and, you know, made me feel pretty much at home. I, um, I saw, I just want to hear if there's a story behind it at all. I saw on your, I was looking up your stats for your career and I saw you basically, you, you shot 0% from the three point line, your entire career, except your first year in the ABA, a hundred percent from, from the three point line. Do you remember, do you remember that shot? How can I, how can I forget it? Josh? Come on, man. <laughs> 
Yes, you can see that you can see that red, white, and blue ball turning around and around and finally going in. I think it might have been a desperation. Um, you know, but yeah, no, I, I was not a three-point shooter, but the game was different back then. Yeah, you, no shit. You know, if even even in the ABA, if if you had a team that took 10 three pointers in a game, oh, that was a right. lot. Yeah. Um, you know, that was almost a shot of last resort. Although, again, it opened up the driving lanes, uh, gave uh, rise to a lot of athletic plays by guys like Julius, like David Thompson, people like that. But, uh, you know, we didn't rely on it. And, you know, this analytics hadn't been born, <laughs> you know, back in those days. Yeah. So, you know, they didn't, people didn't make that decision. It was still play the game in the trenches and, you know, get a good shot, higher percentage shot. Uh, made made sense as opposed to the lower percentage shot of threes. You know, a good three point shooter back then was shooting about thirty percent. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's not awful now, but um, yeah, for me, it'd be great. Uh, I want to <laughs> to get to this. I want to get to your, your your entire career, and of course, your your broadcasting career. And I'd like to know a lot some about your ADA career. Um, but uh. On what did you do on your 40th birthday? There was something that it was a it was a big day for me being from Kentucky. It was it yeah. was a big day for me, your 40th birthday. <laughs> well, well, thank you very much. No, uh, I <laughs> happy birthday. <laughs> I had to I had to work that day. Uh, yeah. Actually, it was Vern Lundquist and I were uh, fortunate enough to have to call the uh, Eastern uh, Regional Final in Philadelphia. Uh, between Duke and Kentucky. And, um, you know, we thought it would obviously be uh, one of those games where, you know, you had to scratch and claw to win that game, but also recognize that, you know, it might be the advent of, of a new kind of basketball where, you know, the, you had guys who could play different positions who were versatile enough. Uh, I'm talking about Jamal Mashburn, Grant Hill, People like that. And then, you know, obviously Christian Leitner, um, you know, obviously stood head and shoulders above everybody in that game, being perfect from the field. And, you know, unfortunately for Kentucky fans, uh, hit that hit that, that game winner. But um, it was great uh, to, to be there in that atmosphere. But the impact of that game and, and the suddenness of, of its ending really didn't uh, it, it really didn't settle in until, you know, hours maybe even days afterwards to recognize you know what a great game that was you know we had coach k on a few weeks ago and he talked about he said the moment of that shot the very moment he didn't see it go in because everybody stood up and his lasting memory was all he saw was a kentucky player fall to his knees and fall to the ground do you remember exactly the moment what you felt in it or what you saw is there is there something frozen in your mind Honestly, what was frozen in my mind was John Pelfrey backing up instead of going at uh, Christian Leitner. And I'm saying, yeah. wait a minute. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I'm sure, you know, Coach Patino and Rick told him in the huddle, no foul, don't foul. Don't foul. But, um, you know, and the ball in the air, once Grant threw the ball in the air, you know, that's anybody's ball. Yeah. But they literally allowed him to catch it uh, because I guess the fear of fouling. And, and that, I mean, obviously, uh, hindsight's twenty twenty. But you know, when that ball was in the air, guys, they should have gone free after. ball, free ball. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah but you, you also you, remember those young brains at that yeah. time too. You haven't played a lot of basketball. You know, it's it, relatively speaking. Um, and but, the last thing you want to do, you got this game won, man. Don't yeah. foul. <laughs> and yeah. of course, it just fell perfectly. I that's that game. I. You know, I love my alma mater. Josh lives and dies. It we 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 do. Um, but I that game uh, hurt me more than any game I that I didn't play in. Like you know, like I was like, oh, I think a lot of it was at the time I was playing in the NBA, and 
Kenny Walker and I were playing with the guys on that team, Jamal and and uh, Travis Ford, and those guys in the summers. And so we'd yeah. gotten to know those guys and were it just oh, it just ripped my heart out. And, and how good was Jamal? He was one of those guys that I said at six, eight, you know, normally back in my day, you're six, eight, you played inside, you That's played right. on the front line. But to be able to handle, shoot from distance, also go inside. You know, I, I said that, you know, this is the the coming of the new kind of player you know did you know it then did you know it right then and there Lynn when you watched him because Josh and I he showed up on UK's campus a little fat a little chubby um and but within the time by the time he got to the gym you just went oh my goodness what is this he can handle it out here at the three-point line he can get it off the board and go did, yeah. When did you see him for the first time, and and did you know he was that good? See, well, I New mean, York City was, kid. Yeah, yeah. I, and I I didn't really follow you know high school basketball in New York right. per se, but you know watching the tape, watching throughout the season. But I, I said it on the air that you know the advent of of the new kind of player now that uh, you know we'll have a chance to look at the mo- mobility and size and, and you know the ability and range. All of those things were were on display in that particular game. And, you know, Grand Hill, same thing. You know, Grand Hill yeah. six 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 seven. 6'7". Uh, you know, those two guys went at it. The shot of the game was, uh, not, it was later the shot, but before that, Sean Woods. Man. Woods, off the bat. And, and I even said, I said, that's a terrible shot. But you did. <laughs> it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lundquist said, was, like, like, who, how do he have the courage to take that shot? I'll, and then I'll tell you that. how he had, I'll tell you how, how he had the courage. Nobody wanted to play on Sean Woods' team in the summer oh, really? in Kentucky because he did stuff like that. He, <laughs> he, he, he would have Jamal Mashburn wide open, and he'd just go in there and throw it up off the glass. But thank goodness it worked out, right? <laughs> Until it didn't. Until it did. <laughs> and the other thing I remember was, uh, you know, Leitner cemented his position as the villain when he stomped on Timberlake's chest. And I tried to give him the benefit of the doubt. I said, I'm not sure he did that on purpose before the replay. And when the replay came, Vern said, oh, yes, he did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember that so well. I also said during the timeout, I said, Vern, if that had happened when we played, we both would have been out of the game. He would have been carried out and I would have been thrown out. That's what, yeah, 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 that's right. That's right. Coach well, that's Pace, what happened yeah. when you play at Rucker. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's, that's right. That's right. Rucker, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, I learned early on you can fight anybody for three seconds until the referees break you up. Right. <laughs> mm-hmm. I was um, real brave when there were refs around. The Rex Chapman Show is sponsored by Fliff. Fliff is a social sports book with a chance to win cash prizes. Fliff customers can purchase Fliff coins, and then as a bonus, Fliff awards free Fliff cash with their purchase. Fliff is the only sports book that gives you free coins and cash daily. Sign up for Fliff, the social sports book. What makes us different, you ask? Fliff is a free to play sports book that awards real cash and prizes. Use the code BBNews for a 100% match bonus. No sports betting in your state? Try Fliff. You were a teenager, Lynn, when you saw Tommy Smith and John Carlos raise their fists uh, in Mexico City. What did that message say to you then? And how did how did that impact? What did that impact have on your own pursuits as an activist? Well, I mean, first of all, it, it was burned into your memory uh, that the sacrifice that they made, you know, ultimately they were thrown out of Olympic Village, vilified, um, you know, called every name in the book by just about everyone except Howard Cosell, who I still give credit to for standing up for them. But, you know, it, it told us that, um, you know, it was it was time to be a man. You know, remember at that time also, yeah. I had picked up the book. That was my um, junior year. Um, it was it was October. It was the beginning of my junior year, and I had picked up autobiography of Malcolm X. So you combine that, and then yeah. in, uh, going in school in September, and then in October you see this happening. And you know, it, it was an awakening. And um, you know, as a as a black man. In even a city like New York, we now can start recognizing the microaggressions beyond mm-hmm. just the outward racism. You recognize the microaggressions, and it was time to time to stand up as an athlete. Now, I the following year, I got elected student council president. You know, I wanted 
to uh, grow our hair long. Uh, and I remember I'm going to Catholic school, but right. I wanted to grow our hair longer. I wanted to go and join in the, the Vietnam uh, War moratorium march and all this stuff. Is, you know, the principal threatened to throw me out of school, um, you know, sat me in the office when the, the um, moratorium went on to make sure that I didn't do anything. Uh, you know, and I appreciate wow. The parochial school idea. He wanted to keep me out of trouble, and he was explained to me that you know you've got potential, but I can't allow you to break the rules. But uh, those were the things that really awakened you um, as a, as a young man during that particular time, and you know, and the kind of political uh, and, and social awareness uh, pretty much stayed with me. Would would you, Josh, and I talk about it often, and we've talked about it several times on on this pod. Um, we grew up in Kentucky, late sixties, early seventies, and it was very confusing for us as, you know, rural white kids. We, there was the greatest Kentucky and ever was from our state, Muhammad Ali. Yeah. And we only knew him as Muhammad Ali. We only knew him called as that when I was very small, that he was called Cassius Clay, but I don't really remember that. And it, it was tough for us to reconcile the fact that many Kentuckians loved him until he changed his name. And, and so we grew up not really understanding why there was this, because he was great. He was undeniably great. And the things he was saying, and that's when we learned, you know, as teenagers, oh, it's just, they don't like what he's saying. Right. right? So what was his, uh, his influence on you? Well, obviously, um, the, the courage to stand up. You know, I wasn't necessarily a fan of, of the Nation of Islam simply because it, it just seemed to me at the time that, you know, the preaching was uh, segregating again. Uh, okay. Not to say that, you know, you can't turn inward to your community and, and expect your community to, to, to grow as we, you know, not rely on Put it this way: We can't rely on the white man to provide for us. We can. We have to provide for ourselves and turn inward. I mean, we we all got that message, and it was important. Uh, however, you know, the total aspect of segregation, having grown up in an integrated neighborhood, having you know white friends, uh, good friends, um, you know, it just wasn't the the type of message that that resonated per se. Uh, so you know, for but him. With his greatness, with his, um, you know, I, I would say his brashness, if you will, and, and being able once again to to stand up to the world and thumb your nose and say, you know, I, I'm doing it my way. You know, it's not, you know, I'm not doing it anybody else's way except my way. And obviously, he was following the nation of Islam. It goes back to to Malcolm, and you know, before he died, he had that awakening that you know it wasn't about the teachings of Elijah Muhammad, he went recognize that, you know, there are people of goodwill that come in all shades, all differences. He talked about Muslims that had blonde hair and blue eyes, and he recognized he was wrong in condemning all white people. Um, and, you know, that that was kind of the kind of resonance that, that, that we listened to. But with Ali being who he was and stood up, and again, the sacrifice being made, and that's the one thing throughout activism that I think defines the true activists, um, the fact that they're willing to sacrifice something to make their statement, to use their platform, it is extremely important when you're putting people on that pedestal. And I think Ali is right there, you know, at the pinnacle, simply because of, of what he gave up in order to, you know, make his conscientious objector status uh, to be true. And, and so we we followed him. In. You know, when I, my freshman year at the University of Maryland is when he came back. And it, it was wow. so interesting because I, I can remember to this day, uh, we're getting ready to listen to the fight on the radio. And you got a lot of guys with long hair, you know, hippies. And, you know, we're thinking we're all brother, brotherhood, peace, love. They didn't like him. And, wow. and I'm saying, whoa, wait a second, man. I thought you were for, for all of this. And for some reason, it would seem to be a visceral dislike for him. They were they were rooting, you know, for uh, you know for him for Joe Frazier, and wow. you know, not that I, I didn't respect yeah. Joe Frazier either, but you know, Ali was the guy, and and that told me something also about 
you know, guys, people, you can't judge people by the cover. You can't judge a book by its cover, so to speak, like Bo did with Sid. So, wow. Yeah, um, we're learning a lot about people in the last eight years, four years. You know, yeah. it's uh, it's that kind of uh, there's an awakening in a sense that uh, we thought we thought we all I thought the majority of us thought in a like minded way. It's been a real shock to me to see not only people that I know and have loved uh, shock me with decisions and who they've yeah. supported in the last few years. But it, I do say it's nice to have it out there. I like to see where yeah, people yeah, stand yeah. in that regard. You know, uh, what do you think about um, uh, the uh, Black Lives Matter and and uh, the movements going on now? I, I think they're absolutely necessary. Um, you know, and people misunderstand uh, the statement Black Lives Matter. It's not to the exclusion of other lives, but it, it's to awaken people to recognize that you know, being preyed upon, being victimized, particularly by the establishment, by law enforcement, you know, we have to recognize that it, it matters as much to us as anyone else's lives matter to them. You know, and when I hear people say, well, all lives matter, you know, they misconstrue the, the, mm-hmm. the whole the whole concept. But, you know, a lot of that's purposeful. You know, a lot of that is is to, to mislead. It's, it's to, you know, obstruct and obfuscate you know, the, the true meaning of, of what that means. And mm-hmm. it doesn't mean, again, to the exclusion of, of other lives that don't matter. But at this stage, people have to recognize that Black Lives Matter, maybe they should put a comma in the word to, T-O-O, uh, because that, that is more of a, more of a definition in, in, in my mind. Um, you said that, that you, you had mentioned right. earlier you wanted to get into, and I don't want to jump the gun since it's your show, but no, no, you know, it ahead. just reminds me when I got out of law school, instead of going the corporate route, when I got out of Harvard Law, I turned down a couple of you know corporate opportunities. I wanted to go back to my hometown and, and make a difference. So I went back to Brooklyn, New York to become an assistant district attorney. Wow. I had not ever thought about being in law enforcement uh, uh, until I was working as a public defender in Boston. And you know, I had to defend a guy who was accused of aggravated rape. And in preliminary hearings, this is to determine whether or not uh, there's enough uh, evidence to go to trial. It's kind of what you see in Perry Mason, who uh, that was one of my fictional heroes. Uh, you, too. <laughs> you, you see him for the most part, there are a couple of trials, but for the most part, he was engaging in, in um, preliminary hearings. And so I wound up having to put the victim on the stand and tear her story down and felt terrible. And my uh, advisor told me that, you know what, if you were on the other side, you could utilize your discretion and you could have charged properly and you wouldn't have to go through this. And I thought about that. And then I did a paper on jury discrimination. And the only prosecutor in America who was on the side of uh, the Supreme Court um, with uh, Thurgood Marshall's opinion that said you can't discriminate in the jury pool, essentially as Batson versus Kentucky, of course, in all wow. cases, uh, was Elizabeth Holtzman, who was the district attorney in Brooklyn, New York. And so I put two and two together and said, you know what, I can work for her. And uh, so, so wow. getting to the point that I'm making is that ultimately, you know, I, I wound up seeing um, law enforcement, the police, you know, brutalizing folks to the point where I joined the special uh, group law enforcement investigation where we tried uh, police misconduct. And I learned an awful lot about not only the type of people who do it, you know, how they cover it up. Um, mm-hmm. The difference is that back then we didn't have cell phones. You know, yeah. it was it was uh, you're, you're it hunting. Was, yeah, it was the offender's word against the victim's word. And right. most juries, you know, would listen and, 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 and believe the police officer. Most of the offenders usually had a record. Um, something that the defense attorneys could tear down when they were on the stand. Uh, but it was a tough job, but at least, you know, we got some convictions and, and we made it work. Um, so when you ask about Black Lives Matter, it just takes me back to those days. And we're talking 35 yeah. years ago or more when we were doing that. Today, I'm not saying it's an easier job. Uh, and it's probably more prevalent today than it ever was, um, victimization by by law enforcement. but Nevertheless, that's one of the reasons why Black Lives Matter 
is is a statement that, that needs to be looked at because overwhelmingly victims of, of law enforcement uh, overreach and brutality are people of color. That law enforcement, you, you really got to see um, uh, and open up your eyes, but certainly um, the uh, be- becoming a lawyer and being in, in that system, adjudication in the process of uh, uh, you had to see it, the same thing in, in, in different ways that like, did you have, a, you know, a time where you're like, I can't believe that it's this slanted or did you always think it was? Um, you know, you're always you're always told it was I never had any um, contact with the judicial system at all. And no one in my family really did. But you heard stories. You know, it goes back to to who's who is it, Richard, Richard Pryor, or someone says when you go down there seeking justice, all you see is just us. Yeah. Uh, that, <laughs> yeah. that, that, that's essentially yeah, what, what you think about, particularly in, in, in criminal law in big cities. I, I'm not sure. I guess small towns, it's the same thing. Uh, but you know, and, and let's face it, there's crime and there are some bad people that need to be put away. You know, I recognize that back in the day. When I was doing bail hearings, um, you know, the, I, defense attorneys would always say, you know, your honor, he's he's a poor man. He doesn't or, you know, he, he comes from a the family that, you know, hasn't taken care of him. He's got these issues. And so they're looking to reduce the bail or no bail. And, you know, based on the case, sometimes I'd have to argue, well, your honor, we'll will agree uh, to bail or, or release an on only recognizance as long as he goes to the defense attorney's neighborhood, not my neighborhood, where my mother and my sister live. Um, wow. Cause that, wow. that's essentially what it comes down to. Yep. But overwhelmingly, again, the, the, the system was slanted uh, against, uh, against poor people, uh, not even just folks of color, but against poor people. And, you know, today we have a, a number of reforms that you would hope um, would you know, kind of level the playing field to some extent and, you know, at least offer some some type of justice. Um, I'm not sure that it's working. And, and I think that many instances people wanted to work against uh, those communities. Um, you know, you're talking about the elimination of cash bail, which always, you know, forced people to go to jail, even for, mm-hmm. you know, minor, comparatively minor uh, things. And then people want to use that as an excuse um, when crime rises and say that it's you know allowing these people back on the street when in reality there's no real connection but you know there's so many different things that that you talk about when you're talking about the criminal justice system i've been out of it for a while now but i I just you know it just saddens me to see you know what uh people who come in contact with that system you know how that system can essentially you know come down on them so hard and then others who commit you know certain crimes, and we can talk about that forever, commit certain crimes uh, against humanity, certain crimes against the people, you know, can get away scot-free because they have the resources and they have the, the connections. I, I'm i sitting here, I'm just mesmerized by, I, well, I'm fascinated. I could listen to you talk about this all day long. Were you ever bored in a, in a basketball locker room? I mean, it's pretty juvenile. And traveling the world with a bunch of what I call fifth graders with money, um, I, I I enjoyed it because I I was one of those guys. You just seem like you had so many other interests. And um, I, were you ever bored? You know, playing ball and or, or thinking, what am I doing with my time? I, actually, Rex, I mean, you know, I love the game uh, until I didn't. Um, mm. When when I left. The Knicks, that was my last year. It was my 10th year in professional basketball. You know, my knees were hurting. Mm-hmm. I wasn't getting the playing time, actually, that I probably should have. Uh, and so I was a little miffed there. But more than anything else, you know, you get that feeling, okay, it's enough. I had another year on my contract. Um, but I could feel it the year before that 10th year. I wound up uh, taking a Stanley Kaplan course to f- get ready for the LSATs. Took wow. the LSATs that summer, um, you know, applied to law wow. school in, the, in in my 10th year. And at the time, I was applying to law schools and, you know, I was telling my girlfriend, who's now my wife, uh, and she she looked at me and said, 
you know, you're applying to Maryland, you know, schools that you're going to get taken, you're going to get accepted by. Why don't you go for the top? And we said, why don't you try for Harvard? And I said, they're not going to take me. Um, you know, this is before I got my LSAT scores. And so, okay, fine. And, you know, the happy wife, happy life type of thing. She wasn't my wife. Um, so I fill out the, uh, the application. Um, even had a cross out. With uh, you know, I didn't fill it out with a typewriter. I did it with a pen, so I crossed yeah. it out. And, uh, <laughs> sent it in, and you know, lo and behold, at the end of the season, we're playing the Celtics in the playoffs. And in April, right before the playoffs start, I get this letter, and it's you know got Harvard on. I said, "Up oh, my rejection letter." Uh, so I, I open it up in front of her, and I was like shocked. Uh, now I, I found, found, wind uh. up finding out that I did pretty well on the LSATs and. You know, so many other different things that, that went into the acceptance. Um, but, you know, ultimately I was accepted. Now, wow. I hadn't made the decision yet, but playing the Celtics, we had an off day and I wound up taking the tea over to Cambridge, walked through the library, walked <laughs> on campus and said, you know what? I'm going to be here. I don't need that. I don't need that extra year. Yeah, that's so, amazing. That's it's almost like happened. being recruited again, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, they. Wow. It, it was all me, though. I, you know, going, yeah, having, having a coffee in Harvard Square, walking through Harkness Commons, um, you know, seeing the students doing their thing, and you know, I, I yearned for going back in the classroom anyway, and you know, I was waiting for debate. You're talking about, you know, hanging out with with guys, and, and a lot of guys that I played with, you know, they were had political knowledge to some okay. extent and, and, and social understanding, but you know, oftentimes it. The debate and, and the discussion didn't right. didn't push you, right? And, and you know, I, I needed to be pushed, and so I, I finally just said, you know what, you know, I I could play another year, um, and but this is where I need to be. Of course, the following year, the guys are playing ahead of me, Bill Cartwright, he gets hurt, Mark <laughs> he gets hurt. Of I course. went to the starting center. <laughs> 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 you remember the, instead it was Ken Ken Bannister. I don't know. The, you Ken the Animal that. Bannister. Yeah, I played yeah. against Ken. Yeah. yeah. He he became yeah. the starting center. For, I could have been the starting center for the Knicks. <laughs> instead of in class. But that's totally <laughs> that's so out. interesting because what Rex was saying about, about the fifth graders with money and that kind of culture and going around the nation together, uh different cities. But there had to be um some teammates that you were a wonderful influence for and that saw your um, curiosity and want of knowledge. I'm sure you were reading and that is there any one that you remember kind of opening their eyes that they'd never got a chance to really be in a, a classroom and uh, absorb thing. They were just pushed to play basketball and do things. Anyone that you said you should read this and they did, or people that you were a great role model to. Well, you know, I'm not sure I was a great role model. I, I think there are some guys who, you know, like to, you know, engage. And you know, I was with the Nets, you know, guys like Mike Jaminski, um, you know, Mike, obviously a Duke guy. Um, My former teammate and yeah, Mike yeah, Jaminski. Yeah. G-Man G would, you know, want to, he'd want to engage a little bit because, you know, he, he went to Duke and he thought mm -hmm. that he, he was, he was uh, <laughs> a brain and, and, you know, he was an intelligent guy. Um, you know, there were some, some other guys. I mean, the, the late Lewis Orr, uh, who, which I, I just, it just broke my heart to find yeah, out. Same, that he same. The you know, Louie and I would, would talk about stuff uh, in depth. Um, and, and there were guys quite honestly that you wouldn't believe that, would sit and listen to me. Um, you know, when I was with the Nets in my second year, after having a pretty good year the coming over and being traded by Milwaukee, the, the first year I was there, you know, Larry Brown didn't think that, uh, you know, I was big enough or strong enough to contend with the centers in the following year. So he went and got a big guy, Daryl Dawkins. And believe it or not, Daryl would sit and would listen and, you know, would he, he wow. would engage. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of there are a number of guys that, that I could talk about, but, but those are guys that kind of stand out a, a bit. Um, that's that's so interesting because I, I like, you know, I think a lot of times athletes get a bad rap. It's like um, 
coaching. You know, guys, guys want to be coached. Guys want to be taught. Guys want to learn. It's just they want to learn uh, from someone who's not going to beat them over the head with things they don't know. Right. And, and, you know, being in a locker room, uh, you know, for, for, uh, for instance, you brought up Daryl, you know, uh, someone like that who, you know, didn't, he went straight from high school, you know, had no sort of experience from high school to all of a sudden he's playing against grown men, grown ups, right. And, you know, unless he's got, you know, uh, an, an ant with geopolitical experience, maybe he hasn't been exposed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've just got to think it hardens you some to to know that you've probably had a pretty profound uh, impact on a lot of guys. And, and he would he would admit it, you know, he, yeah. he, would, he would tell people that, you know, I, I told him this and then he, he followed wow. me and listened to that. And, and, you know, you had other guys who went on to you know, professional careers after basketball, uh, you know, Steve Green, who played in Indiana, yeah. uh, AIU, and then we played together with the patients. Steve was a, a dentist in, in Indianapolis and very successful. And he and I were very, are very close to, you know, as, as players. There, there are a number of guys, like I said, awesome. that, you know, listen. So, you know, I'm happy to, to know that, you know, there's guys who are successful, those who are, who are still around. So, and you have to know that it's, it's, uh, you probably changed a lot of people's lives on planet Love Tron. <laughs> you took that knowledge back. <laughs> That's right. And no question. Yeah. That's uh, great. I want I want to ask you about one game in particular. I want to go back to college for just a second. Uh you guys were uh invited to play in Pauley Pavilion oh, when no. uh uh and you play you went there and played against uh uh, the Bruins, what was that like? And I think you gave them like their closest game in three or four years, didn't you? Yeah, I, I guess. I mean, look, it was uh, it, it was great because, you know, all the hullabaloo lefty who never really said that Maryland was going to be the UCLA to East. He said something to the effect we got the resources <laughs> that we could. But, you know, people, you know, what happens is it goes to the, like the game telephone. Next thing you know, mm -hmm. you know, after the third or fourth person, Lefty said they were going to be the UCLA and the East. <laughs> well, you know, finally, you know, the Twain met, and um, you know, Bill and and Tom McMillan at the time were like the Ballyhoo High School guys. Yeah. Uh, you know, Tom on the cover of Sports Illustrated. But um, you know, we recognized how good they were, and then when we found out we were going to play them, it was prior to their winning the national championship. Uh, our junior year and bill had a, a great game against uh memphis it was like 22 tw out of 23 field goals something like that wow. uh, when we knew we were, we, when we knew we were going to play them i took that video and i watched that constantly and so you know when we we're ready to play and you know we had a pretty good rapport you know we visited with each other before the game um you know, got to know each other a, a little bit. Uh, when the game was played, though, at Pauly, um, you know, I, I recognized that I knew everything he was going to do. He wound up shooting eight for 24. Wow. Uh, blocked his first shot. Uh, the second one, he got me up in the air. That's the one that's on the cover of Sports Illustrated. But, you know, he had trouble all game. You know, I had a decent game. I had an 18 and 14. He had about 27 rebounds because he never left the paint. And that, that allowed me, you know, I was going to the top of the key in the free throw line, knocking down shots. And, you know, he blocked McMillan's shots, Lucas's shots. They had subpar games. But, you know, we wanted about this scoring was in a, them. This was in an era, though, where you didn't you didn't watch film as a team. You did that on your own. Yeah, I mean, well, you think about how conscientious that is. Well, I, remember the, what I said about the Rucker it taught me. Yeah. Do yeah. not get embarrassed. Do not get embarrassed. And I was not wow. about to be embarrassed. Um, wow. But, you know, we wound up outscoring them 9-0 down the stretch the last two minutes. And, you know, they beat us by one. A hand check on Lucas by Dave Myers out of bounds. Um, and right in front of uh, the late uh, Booker Turner, who's the official, whose nickname was Booker Bruin. But we won't go into that per se. But, um, <laughs> yeah, no, I remember blocking the, blocking the one shot on Bill and I unfortunately knocked it out of bounds, but I, I hit it so hard that it went over Coach Wood's head. He had to duck, you know, with the 
with the program, and it kind of set the set the stage uh, for our for our, um, our confrontation. But you know, he obviously he is a great college player. Um, we could have made our mark. We missed it by one that same year. We lost to NC State in overtime in a period when we were number three in the nation. They were number one in the ACC wow. tournament. Only one team was going to the NCAA tournament. That's uh, crazy. Yeah. And, and of course, they realized that the year after. Yes. They the field. <laughs> Is that what happened? Yeah. That, it was that, because it was of our that game. year. I mean, yeah, it was. I don't it, think I realized that. Yeah. Yeah. They expanded wow. the field because, you know, you can't have the number three team in the country. And we wound up being number four uh, at the end of the season because um, who was politics. It, uh, <laughs> so Marquette, well, no, Marquette wound up going to the finals, okay. so they pushed them ahead of us. But, um, you know, it was UCLA, NC State. No, it was NC State, UCLA, Marquette, and us. And they, you know, they realized how the number three team in the nation not play in the NCAA tournament. Mm -hmm. But that's what happened to us. We were victimized there. So uh, I will say this to any Maryland fans that are listening, I mean, Gary Williams and his group in 2002 made us proud and won the national championship. But the first national championship Maryland ever won was when we won the NIT in uh, 1972. And that's when the NIT, you know, had a field of 32. That's right. And just like the NCAA tournament. And so the NCAA tournament is now a field of 64. You know, we we won a national championship for Maryland, yeah. but it doesn't get recognized. Well, it should. Josh and I know very well we can't go anywhere in Lexington where all of our championships aren't put up there. And every one of we've got all our NCAA ones. We also have all of our NIT ones, and they're mm -hmm. up there in the banner just the same. See, we don't have that in, in Xfinity, which you know sometimes agitates that's, me. Yeah, that, that seems, seems silly. Yeah. Um, yeah. I want to ask you one more basketball question before we we let you go. Um, Josh and I are a little younger than Len Bias, and it affected us in a profound way without even knowing him. Uh, we had Walt Williams on. We've had uh, Gary Williams on, and they've all spoken about uh, how Len's passing uh, affected them. Could you talk a little bit about how it uh, how it impacted you? Well, I mean, you know, I didn't know Lynn very well. You're talking about playing in the summertime, and, and that's mm -hmm. kind of when we played with those guys a little bit. But it was towards the end of my career, so I didn't spend a whole lot of time. But I, I knew that, that group of guys, because uh, I still maintain contact with Coach Giselle. Um, you know, they're, they're a talented bunch of guys, and he was head and shoulders above all of that talent. Uh, but I recall uh, exactly where I was when I heard uh, about his passing. I was driving to my summer job uh, at the public defender in Boston. And I was in the car and I was about to leave listening to the radio and they made the announcement. And, you know, obviously Boston had drafted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I, I swear mm -hmm. to God, I, I stayed in that car listening to that for almost an hour. I couldn't move. And I, you know, I was in shock. Um, but, you know, as you sit and you realize during the times and the things that were going on uh, during those days and from the culture that, you know, it was it, it wasn't as surprising as you would think uh, because yeah. of the proliferation of, of, of those drugs, et cetera. Uh, but but just the idea of such a talent, you know, being wasted like that, um, you know, you wonder, you know, how how could that be? Now, you know, in the aftermath, I was actually asked to join a task force uh, on the campus to kind of figure out, OK, what can they do better? Uh, because in some ways the university may have failed him, you know, in, in other ways, obviously his group around him failed yeah. him and, and, you know, he made the mistake, but, um, you know, there are a lot of things, positive things that came out of it, uh, with regard to, you know, how students were, how student athletes were going to be treated at the university of Maryland. And, you know, so, you know, his death wasn't in vain, uh, but, you know, he was probably the most talented player that Maryland never had then and now. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's just a, a waste of humanity. It's a shame. How, how did uh, how did Coach Drizel, uh lefty, how did he I, – I played against his team once. Um, how did he impact you in your life? Um, you know, Coach and I, we, we had a, a mostly love, sometimes not so much <laughs> relationship. Uh, but the one thing that he instilled was – 
you know, the desire to continue to get better and, and to be better. I mean, I did the best I could with what I had. You know, I had a bunch of injuries in, in the pros. I mean, my second year in the pros, I averaged almost 15 and, and 11. And wow. then the following year when we were making the move to the NBA, I wrecked my knee in preseason. <laughs> And never really the same after that. But and and that's know. before scopes. You're getting cut on. Oh yeah. At that oh point. yeah. yeah. I was cut yeah. Right. You know, my yeah. stars about that big. Right. Right. right me. Um, but but no, coach instilled a work ethic. Um, you know, he always had a lot of those Dale Carnegie sayings uh, <laughs> on the on the wall. The harder I work, the luckier I get. And, you know, opportunity, <laughs> yeah. preparation, and all that kind of stuff. And it, it just it just stays with me. And, yeah. um, you know, you believe it. And yeah. He was, uh, you know, he, he was one of those guys that, that preached and lived what he preached. So, uh, you know, my hat's off to him. And even to this day, 90 years old, you know, he's still going, still talking Amazing. smack. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> uh, what What's your favorite movie, Lynn? Ah, uh, The Godfather, I have to say. It's well probably, done. Still, it still sticks with me, man. Yeah. There's so many in the. The, the different sayings and you know the the vignettes that you can see that uh, the human uh, confrontation as well as you know the love that you can see as well and also the ambiguities of life you know, all of that in that particular movie and I'm saying Godfather one Godfather two part two was good but not as yeah. good as one okay all right fair enough what about if you could set sit front row center uh, to see any uh, athletic event, any uh, entertainment event, any speaker, oh. any of that dead or alive? Wow. Josh, that's hard. Man. That is <laughs> tough. There, there are so many things. You know who I would love to have seen in life and do his July 4th speech would be Frederick Douglass. You know, considering oh, yeah. what he, wow. where he came from and what the environment was even at that particular time and to hear a, a guy from enslavement to be able to speak as eloquently as he did with no formal education wow. and to have those folks actually respect him um to the point where he could speak in front of a, a mixed audience in, in that particular time uh, you know you, you just think about all of that and uh, wow you know, somebody and internationally as well. I mean, yeah. you, internationally, that's, you know, to go overseas and do his tour of speaking. I mean, that that's incredible. Yeah. That's a wow. great pick. Wow. We never had. That's a great one. What? Let me ask you, because I'd be remiss if I didn't. And I'm sure it's really a hard question, too. But do you have a favorite book? Um, yeah, you know, I mean, as I said, the one book that had a tremendous impact on me was the autobiography of Malcolm X. I mean, I, I could, you know, I can read that again and again. Wow. Simply because, you know, living the life that I did in New York City and growing up, um, it was an awakening. Yeah. Know, if nothing else, it, it was a book of parables uh, for a young man, uh, a young black man, uh, you know, trying to realize who they were. And where you're from the depths that where you could rise if you would, um, you know, I, I think about that. But you know, there are so many other things. Uh, also, uh, the Grapes of Wrath, uh, ah. Steinbeck, uh, was another one that I I had a profound impact on me my freshman year um, in, in college because again, you, you're looking at your community, and, and you know, the it was. Uh, uh, definitely a parallel to a lot of things that were going on in, in the community at that particular time. Um, so, you know, those two books probably had Fantastic. the greatest impact. So. Lynn, I can't thank you enough. Can't thank you enough for doing this. I, I think back, uh, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot wrong with social media and the internet and all that. But I also think, man, how awesome would it have been for kids like Josh and I to be able to get on the internet and, and type up, you know, what's Lynn Elmore thinking about today? You know, what's he doing today yeah. as young people, you know, to have that voice, you came up in a voice where, you know, the team was going to make a, a statement on your behalf for the most part. And that was going to be the narrative. And now that 
Um, you know, we are where we are. I'm just glad that, you know, you're able to, that you've paved the way for so many others to, to speak their minds. Well, no, I appreciate it, guys. The opportunity is great. And, you know, congratulations to you for all you've been able to accomplish these days, man. It's, it's great to see. Thank Josh, you. great meeting you as well. And uh, Nice to meet you, sir. Hopefully, uh, you know, we'll get a chance to do this down the road. We'll do it yeah. again. That'd Thanks, man. Thank you so much. That was great. Well, you say it. I don't want to. Well, that's been a uh, another episode of Between Two Turds. Thank you. Gosh, Gosh once again, I, how do I, here's what I don't get. How do these people continue to come on the show? I, I mean, that I can't help you because because if they're talking to one another, they have to be like, don't do that. Those guys are turds. And, and then they end up coming on the show anyway. I, I, I don't Lynn know. Elmore, I, no I mean, idea. I, I'm almost intimidated talking to him. Oh, almost? Not almost. Yeah, almost, I am yeah, intimidated. Yeah, there's a man that is not to be trifled with. No, no. Yeah. He left he, the NBA and was at Harvard Law School <laughs> the next <laughs> semester. Yeah. Um, uh, he teaches. <laughs> we didn't get into it. He teaches, still teaches a yeah. class at, uh, at Columbia. Yeah. He's a New Yorker. Through and through, yes. and he stayed. He, he stayed in New York. He, you heard the uh, sirens go by. He didn't even. He didn't even hear no, them. I was that's wondering, New was is that me? Or and he was like, oh yeah, it's yeah, yeah. out here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Doesn't even hear it though. That was the way when I lived in the city. It'd be, Meh! you know, I'd just be like, don't even, you know, the train comes by. But yeah, for a guy and what he's lived through and what he participated oh. in. And the influence he must have been on so many people that he doesn't even know just to be that astute, to be that guy, to be the guy on the bus that's reading. As I see, I I had to ask him that because, you know, I play on teams. We had no readers, you know, and that's a really that that makes for a really bad team to to think about it. Uh, (laughs) but, But but then you play. Then you play on a team that has a voracious reader and they're almost they're almost just banished from the group. Like, mm-hmm. oh, he's up there reading. <laughs> yeah. He could be back here playing dice and telling fart jokes and shit. Uh right. but no, and so I I often think, you know, guys like Len, who had so many other interests, had to Mahmoud Abdul Rauf. Yes. And you know, um, Rest in peace, Armand Gilliam. Mm-hmm. Um, well, or Kurt Rambis, for instance. You know, mm-hmm. just a brilliant guy. But Kurt, Kurt could do either. But you know, there. It, sometimes I felt like, oh man, that's got to be a little bit of a lonely existence because we're together all the damn time, right? right. You're you're together right. constantly. Um, the basketball binds you, but it can only bind you so far off the court, sure, right? Sure, yeah, sure, right. Yeah, that that was also I found it really interesting, just because, you know, you think of him playing uh, at Poly Pavilion and almost beating that kind of UCLA group, and that's just this historic time of basketball that's mm-hmm. so far removed from from me. And Same. then to hear him talking about players he played with, and, and you be like, I played with him. I'm like, what? <laughs> how did that? How? I know what? I know. I know. Well, I, he he said somebody on there. Uh, there were two other guys he mentioned. I was like, yeah. Oh, he said Bill Cartwright got hurt. I played against Bill my mm-hmm. first two three years mm-hmm. in the NBA. Didn't you play against Kareem? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's it's crazy, seem right? Yeah. Anyway. All right, buddy. That was amazing. Uh, Want to do it again next week? I'd love to. All right. That was episode 69 with Len Elmore. We'll be back next week on the Rex Chapman Show with super dope Josh Hopkins, powered by basketballnews.com. <laughs>